Lecture seven: Is mathematics absolute truth? In the previous lectures as well as tutorials, we learned about different ancient civilizations. For example, Babylonian, Egyptians, as well as Chinese mathematics. Some characteristics include lack of generalizations. Instead of proofs, what we find are descriptions of particular procedures. The Greek mathematics was different from the other civilizations. Greek geometry was the first example of a deductive system with axioms, theorems, and proofs. Famous mathematicians include Pythagoras and Euclid. Euclid's Elements has thirteen books. It used a limited number of assumptions, five postulates, and five axioms to prove all other results. The propositions were arranged so as to form a chain of geometric reasoning. All the theorems or propositions were rigorously proved, so it proposed a concept of formal proofs. Elements is the longest-running textbook in the history. Before the 19th century, it was widely believed that the universe worked according to the principles of Euclidean geometry. Euclidean geometry was considered the apex of intellectual achievement for about two thousand years. So the first four books of Elements talks about plane geometry. Proposition forty-seven in Book One is the Pythagoras theorem. Do you want to guess what proposition forty-eight is? It is the converse of Pythagoras theorem. Important theorems in Book Five to Book Ten include arithmetic mean is greater than geometric mean, as well as the fundamental theorem of arithmetic. Fundamental theorem of arithmetic said that every number can be decomposed into products of primes uniquely. Book eleven to book thirteen talk about spatial geometry. In book thirteen, it constructs the five regular platonic solids and proves that there are no further regular solids. So, what are these five platonic solids? They are tetrahedron, cubed, octahedron, dodecahedron, as well as icosahedron. Right now, I would like you to pause this video and watch this YouTube video on the fifth postulate. The fifth postulate is very important in our upcoming discussion. So the fifth postulate said that when you have two black straight lines here, and then you have a third line cutting through them, then you form the interior angles alpha and beta. So when these two straight lines, if they produced indefinitely and then they meet somewhere, then alpha and beta would add up to be less than two right angles, which is one. Eighty degrees. The fifth postulate is sometimes called the parallel postulate because basically it talks about parallel lines. So you can imagine that if these two black lines do not meet, then alpha plus beta would be one eighty degrees. So for more than thousand years, mathematicians were troubled by the complexity of the fifth postulate. And then they believed that it could be proved as a theorem from the other four postulates. Polkas attempted to prove the fifth postulate from the other four, but he failed. You see here, Polkas is already seven hundred years after Euclid, so Polkas went on to give a false proof of his own. However, he did give the following postulate, which is equivalent to the fifth postulate. So we will have an easier version. So the Pythagorean axioms said that, given a line and a point which is not on the line, it is possible to draw exactly one line through the given point which is parallel to the line. So here, the first person to really come to understand the problem of the parallels was Gauss. He began to work on the fifth postulate when he was fifteen years old. At first, he followed what his ancestors did. He attempted to prove the parallel postulate.
from the other four. By 1814, he had made a little progress, and wrote. In the theory of parallels, we even now not further than Euclid. This is a shameful part of mathematics. However, by 1817, Gauss had become convinced that the fifth postulate was independent from the other four. He began to work by assuming the fifth postulate is false, and concluded that there is a new world, non-Euclidean geometry. Gauss discussed the theory of parallels with his friend, the mathematician Frank Eisvoyd, who had made several false proofs of the parallel postulates. Frank Eisvoyd taught his son Yanor's mathematics and advised his son not to waste one hour's time on that problem. Eisvoyd, the father said, "You must not attempt this approach to parallels. I know this way to its very end." I have transversed this bottomless night with extinguished all night and joy of my life. I entreat you, leave the science of parallels alone. I thought I would sacrifice myself for the sake of the truth. For God's sake, I beseech you, give it up. Fear it no less than sensual passions, because it too may take all your time and deprive you of your health, peace of mind, and happiness in life. Boyai, like all the sons who did not listen to their fathers, in 1823, he wrote to his father, saying, "I have discovered things so wonderful that I was astounded. Out of nothing, I have created a strange new world." With that said, Boyai, the son, has also discovered non-Euclidean geometry. Boyai, the father, was so proud and so happy. So he responds to that, when the time is right for certain things, these things appeared in different places in the manner of violets coming to light in early spring. So he worried that some other people or some other mathematicians who would discover the same thing as Boyaidison. So his father urged him to publish the result as soon as possible. So what does it mean by the time is right for certain things? In the history. Some mathematical or scientific concepts were born at a very close time in different places. For example, Newton and Leibniz both developed calculus at a similar time in different places. Another example is Einstein and Lorentz. Both of them developed the concept of special relativity. So mathematically, Lorentz developed what we call the Lorentz transformation. Albert Einstein also developed the same idea in relativity. Schrödinger used differential equations to describe quantum mechanics, while Heisenberg used matrix theory to describe quantum mechanics. So both of them were working on quantum mechanics at a very similar time period, but they used different methods and they work on it in different places. Church and Turing. Both of them work on the Einstein's problems, so decision problem. So what Boyai, the father, worried is that at the same period of time, someone else has also developed the non-Euclidean geometry, and indeed Boyai, the father, was right. So when Boyai told Gauss what his son has done, Gauss said, "If I start by saying I cannot praise it, then you will most likely be taken aback." But I cannot do it otherwise. To praise it would be to praise myself, the entire contents of the work, the path that your son has taken, and the results to which it leads, are almost perfectly in agreement with my own meditations, some going back thirty to thirty-five years ago. In truth, I am astonished. My intention was not to release any of my work in my lifetime. Most people don't have a true sense of what is involved. And I have found very few who are particularly interested. So I am truly surprised that I am now spared this effort. And it is the greatest joy for me that precisely the son of my old friend is the one who preceded me in such a remarkable manner. Gauss then spends two and a half pages suggesting notations and sketching his own proof of some of the results. I have merely given an outline of the proofs, with no details and polish. As I have no time to devote to this, feel free to communicate these to your son. 
At least I ask you to give him my best regards and assure him of my particularly high esteem. At the same time, urge him to work on the following problem: determine the volume of tetrahedron. Since the area of the triangle is so easy to find, one would expect that the volume would have an equally easy expression, but this expectation is not fulfilled. So first. One can imagine how disappointed Boyai the father would be, because his son essentially solved a two thousand years problems. But then, when Boyai the father told Gauss, but Gauss has already did the mathematics. So on the other hand, when Gauss wrote、uh, the area of triangle is so easy to find, what he meant is the area of triangle in non-Euclidean geometry. So the volume of tetrahedron in non-Euclidean geometry is not easy to find, and therefore, Gauss challenged Boyai to solve this problem. So one could imagine how disappointed Boyai the father and the son were. Why did Gauss have no intention to publish his work in the lifetime? After all, he solved a two thousand year problem. At that time, thinking was dominated by Kant, who thought that Euclidean geometry is unalterable, and Gauss disliked controversies. Euclidean geometry stood unchallenged as the mathematical model of space for two thousand years until the nineteenth century. Did you remember Boyai the father said, "When the time is ripe for certain things." These things appear in different places in the manner of violets coming to light in early spring. A Russian Lobachevsky developed non-Euclidean geometry independent of Boyai. His paper, however, was rejected by the Saint Petersburg Academy of Science for publication. Gauss appreciated Lobachevsky's published works very highly. So we spend some time on the story of the development of non-Euclidean geometry. So what exactly is non-Euclidean geometry? We have to start with Euclidean geometry. Euclidean geometry was developed at the time of Euclid, which is 300 BCE. So what we learned today in our mathematics textbooks mostly is Euclidean geometry. So there are some basic propositions of Euclidean geometry include. The shortest distance between two points is one unique straight line. An angle sum of triangles is one eighty degrees. So I think you are very familiar with these propositions. Non-Euclidean geometry is any geometry that is different from Euclidean geometry. Each non-Euclidean geometry is a consistent system of definitions, assumptions, and proofs, which describe objects such as points. Lines and planes. For example, hyperbolic geometry and elliptic geometry are non-Euclidean geometry. Did you remember Playfair axioms? Playfair axioms is the equivalence of the fifth postulate. So in Euclidean geometry, Playfair axiom or the fifth postulate actually means, given a point and a line. There's exactly one line passing through this point that is in the same plane as the given line, and they never intersect. In hyperbolic geometry, there are at least two such distinct lines. So, given point P and this black line, there are at least two distinct lines passing through this point and are parallel to this line. While in elliptic geometry, there's no such line. So the essential difference in Euclidean geometry and non-Euclidean geometry is the nature of parallel lines. We can imagine that hyperbolic geometry is a curved space, and it plays an important role in Einstein's general relativity. So the angle sums of triangle is always less than one hundred eighty degree, and there is no similar triangles. So the picture here, and this one, is a painting series that we call the Circle Limit, drawn by the Dutch painter M. C. Escher. So here, you see in this picture, 
all the devils and angels are congruent. So he used the Poincaré disk to represent the hyperbolic surface. You may wonder why this devil and this devil is congruent. So you can imagine you hold a ruler and you stand here. So when you walk to the boundary, the ruler will diminish with you together. So when you use the same ruler to measure this devil, it has the same size as this one. So all the angels and devils are congruent on this Poincaré disk. And there is no similar triangles or similar shapes in hyperbolic geometry. On the other hand, in analytic geometry, angle sum of triangles is always greater than 180. Elliptic geometry is the geometry on the surface of the Earth. Here is the equator and it is the latitude. And when you draw two longitude here, of course, longitude and latitude are perpendicular to each other. And that is why you have 90 degrees here. But we see that here you got a 50 degrees. So angle sum of triangle on this curved surface is greater than 180 degrees. So suppose you are a B777 pilot in command planning to fly from Hong Kong to New York. Would you fly through Pacific Ocean in this way, like a straight line? Well, you know the answer is not. Because if you really fly from Hong Kong to New York, you realize that we actually fly through the North Pole. So in elliptic geometry, there are no straight lines. All lines curved on the sphere. Lines are defined such that the shortest distance between two points lies along them. But the shortest distance between any two points is not unique. For example, if you want to go from the North Pole to the South Pole, there are many ways that you can go from the North Pole to the South Pole with the same distance. Some science fictions and fantasy use non-Euclidean geometry in their book. So I went to Art Basel in 2017, and I also think that um, in this artwork, they use non-Euclidean geometry as the concept. So basically, we see that in Euclidean geometry, we have five postulates and five axioms, and then we deduce all the propositions in the 13 books. While in non-Euclidean geometry, you still have the first to four postulates, while the fifth one, the parallel postulates, is negated in the non-Euclidean geometry, then mathematicians also develop the whole new world, which can also be applied in physics, such as Einstein's general relativity. So I have one final question for all of you. Is mathematics absolute truth?